Thank you for sharing in the privilege of uh, studying God's Word. This is always such a blessing in our lives. Before we look at Matthew 27, I just want to touch on something very quickly in 1 Peter chapter 1, because there's just an expression from this has just kind of kept ringing in my mind this week. And also just a quick note. Um, we're not going to be able to cover all the material I've handed out to you. I normally do 10 to 12 pages of notes for a class, so you get the Reader's Digest version. And uh, this week it just kind of kept growing. And uh, as someone in our class said, that I enjoy going home later and having a cup of coffee and reading what I missed in class that we just didn't get to. So there's going to be more than we're going to be able to touch on today, but that's okay. I'll leave that to the, uh, the Bereans in the group to, to work with. Peter. And I oftentimes stop and think when I read First Peter, we have kind of one of the longest progressions of, aha, I finally get it. It's nearly 30 years before he finally gets it, the full part of it. And can you imagine the guy who sees the vision before he goes to Cornelius' house and hear these unclean animals come down and he says, Lord, you know, this is a decade later. I've rise and kill and eat. I've never touched anything unclean. And then you open First Peter and here are elect strangers, Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And he's going to spend the latter part of his life with those people that when he became an apostle were unclean. But he makes a comment about our Old Testament writers and prophets in specific. And I'm in First Peter 1 and 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come. Isn't that an interesting expression? And we're thinking specifically about Isaiah today. And he's going to be 700 years. His ministry is 740 to 700 B.C. And so we're going to pick up just one little expression from Isaiah. But 700 years beforehand, he spoke of the grace that was to come to you. And I always kind of do this physically with my hand when I read this, searching intently to try to find out the time and the circumstances in which, isn't this interesting, the spirit of Christ in them was pointing out when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that were to follow. One twelve. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And isn't this amazing? Even the angels long to look into these things. And so what we have is that this expression, the Spirit of Christ, is working through the prophets. And if we go back to Moses, really easy to remember Moses 1,500 years before Jesus, David about 1,000, and then with Isaiah. And it just says they, they were looking intently, trying to figure out, well, what is this? What does this actually mean? None of them could ever have seen the babe born in Bethlehem. And Micah may have, may have predicted, oh, the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. But none of them could, could have seen that far ahead of time. And this wonderful little expression in Isaiah 53 and 9 they made his grave with the wicked, and you stop and think, I'm thinking of the two criminals on either side, and with a rich man in his death. 700 years beforehand, Isaiah could never have seen specifically, oh, Joseph of Arimathea. And we're going to see this even in our Lord's Supper today. Not only was a rich man, what did the... I think I used the term, he had a prepaid funeral plan. He is not going to be buried in the ground. <clears throat> he has carved out a tomb out of the stone. How expensive would that be? They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violent story. And it's very kind of enigmatic. It's not real clear initially. <laughs> And I'm sorry, I just have to laugh. Uh, um, if you catch a fairly large bass who's, who's eating some, some small perch, if they've been in 
for a couple of days. They're bleached white, but they've been in the, the justice system. Of, of a big bass. And so when you clean them out, you come to these little bitty fish, and just that's, that's just life inside a big fish. C can you imagine being inside the digestive juices of a big fish big enough to swallow you for three days? I don't know. He may have lost his hair. He may be just bleached. But I guarantee you this, <laughs> that has given you some time to kind of stop and pause and think about the consequences of disobedience. <laughs> and we would all be the same thing. You get spit out on the shore, and you're getting out the GPS, and you're saying, where's Nineveh? <laughs> you're going you're gonna to be making a beeline straight for where you're supposed to go. But just imagine physically being inside and can I say it probably smelled kind of fishy? And just this, this whole experience of, of being there. And so here's this kind of unusual story in the Old Testament about the runaway prophet. And then our Lord says, oh, in the same way Jonah is in the belly of the big fish, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And this is something that's just going to echo all the way through the end of the book of Matthew. But it's in John 2. I did this sample, verse 19. Uh, destroy this temple, and three days I'm going to raise it again. And as we said, Herod the Great's been remodeling the temple uh, at this time for 46 years. They're going to be working on it. Uh, and I think they get it finished in AD 62. And they've worked on this temple for over a century, and, and our Lord says, destroy this temple. Well, what is he talking about? Well, he's not talking about pillars and columns and stone. He's talking about his body, but they don't understand that. And then in Matthew 26, when they're doing these mock trial and all the things that were going on, uh, this fellow said, destroy this temple, the temple of God, and I will rebuild it in three days. Now, I just want to engage just a little bit of historical imagination and you know, just, just be one of the, and you fill in the blank, members of the Sanhedrin, one of the chief priests. And it's very interesting, if you have a concordance, either in paper or on computer, you go back and look at words like kill, destroy, these other types of words. And in the Gospels, it's these religious leaders very early are making plans. We, we just got to kill him. That's their option. They finally get it done. And can you just imagine the sense of rejoicing of this particular group of people? God is good. We're, we're clean. We didn't have to go into Pilate's household. We finally, finally got rid of, of this, this scourge of the earth. And at least for the first three days, <laughs> they, were just, they were just kind of glowing in these wonderful things that have happened. So there was, for, for them, there was much to celebrate that Passover evening. They have been looking for a way to kill him. We finally succeeded. They had forced Pilate's hand. He turned Jesus over to them. And remember, uh, we're not going to go into the Roman palace and become defiled. We want to be able to take the Passover. So we get the trade that we wanted. We get a prisoner swap. They have a full-scale rebuttal of his claim to be the Son of God. And in all the accounts, Mark does this to kind of begin with, every group of society is doing something to either ridicule, to mock, and to scorn. Oh, well, if you're the son of God. Oh, he saved others. He can't save himself. And so for those who have been plotting and planning this for a long time, this particular Passover would have been especially satisfying because we have finally laid to rest all of those false claims about his deity and divinity, and we have followed the law of Moses scrupulously. And when you read in Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23, uh, the impact of this verse is the bodies were not to be left on the cross overnight. Gruesome. If the Romans were doing it, they preferred to leave them up there even to the point of decay just for the visual. This is what happens if you uh, transgress and, and cross Rome. The Jews, on the other hand, because of Deuteronomy... That's why they go and break the legs of the criminals, because they do not want the bodies up there overnight. And so when we get ready to take the Passover, not only did we not become unclean with Pilate, we have followed the law of Moses. We broke the legs of the two criminals. Jesus had died. Everybody's off the crosses before dark. 
But, and this always interests me, who is it that remembers the three days and three nights? It's not the apostles. It's his critics, his enemies. And we're going to read this in a second. Sir, we remember when that imposter was alive, he said. And isn't it amazing that we never know who's going to listen and who's going to comprehend a given lesson? I, <laughs> I don't know if I would do this again in hindsight, but uh, I directed four sessions at Quartz Mountain before we went to Australia. And uh, I'm a camp director at 22. I guess I don't know if I didn't know better, but I'd just been there all my life and said, yes, I'll be glad to do that. We'd had a whole event of things happen the year before, and we'll just do this one. Bless her heart. The largest, we went up on the, it's now called Young's Mountain, we went up on the South Mountain, and the largest camper in the group sprained her knee, and so three of us carried her down in a fireman's chain down the, and it's getting dark, so we sent everybody down, we had a flashlight, and so Greg, you get on one side, I get on the other until we get, start getting a cramp in her arms, and then we put her down on her good leg. Okay, you take the flashlight, I'll go on this side. And it took well over an hour for three of us to carry this girl down to the car. We look like a garden hose is on us. We're just, we're just exhausted. I'm heading to the emergency room of the Altus Hospital at 11.30, just wet as can be. Walk in, and because of the events of last year, the head nurse saw me coming in. She said, you, you sit in that chair. You do not get up. You ask me to go to the bathroom, and I won't tell you what all happened the year before. And we get this girl in. I'm just sitting there and trying to collect myself. I'm just damp and wet and everything. And this voice says, you're Dale Hartman. And I want to say, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. He said, yes, you're Dale Hartman. I said, yes. He said, well, you don't know me, but you worked at Childress, Texas for two summers, and I visited my grandmother for a week. Didn't do any activities, but you gave two lessons while I was there. And one was on the parable of the pearl of great price and the treasure in the field. And he said, I took copious notes of those, and that week I memorized those two lessons, and I could have done it to save my life. He then gives me the full outline of both lessons. And I'm just kind of in a state of shock. You know, here I am, just kind of like a drowned rat and just trying to recover. And this guy comes on and just spits out two years earlier complete lessons. And he said, I didn't have anything else to do. And so three times I've been in a devotional and the speaker didn't show up. And I said, oh, I've got a lesson. I can do this. And he said, I've been doing these lessons all over the place. Blow me over. I, I wouldn't have known him, never met him. We never know who's listening to God's word. The apostles who had heard the most for three and a half years don't get it. And the critics who've heard a snippet here or there, what do they remember? Ah, oh, that imposter kept using that term three days. <sighs> I've just shaken down the chills. It was evening, Matthew 27, 57. A rich man from Arimathea named Joseph and we get this wonderful little hint, who was also a disciple of Jesus. And you'll hear this more than once today. The literal translation of this was, he was discipled by Jesus. And, and we don't know, where, where did this happen? How did this take place? How does someone who is a respected member of the council have this contact with Jesus so that he is a disciple of Jesus, even though he's still at this point a part of the council? He went to Pilate, and then here it comes. He asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and you can imagine we're going to have to go check. Yes, he's dead. They come back. And remember our time scale? On the cross, 9 o'clock, darkness at, at noon. 3 o'clock he dies. We start making the request to Pilate after 3 because we have to get these guys off the cross, and we're especially going to try to get Jesus buried uh, before the, the Passover begins. Joseph took the body, and only Matthew tells us Joseph wrapped the body in a clean linen shroud. And Lord willing, next week, that's something that's going to come up from the Gospel of John. He laid it in a new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. He rolled a great stone in the entrance of the tomb and went away. And notice, as my brother-in-law says, if you're allergic to women, you're going to be really uncomfortable in heaven. Heaven's going to be full of women. 
Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. So as we're going to see when we read through this from John, it's going to be Joseph of Arimathea, and of all things, Nicodemus. They're going to be the partners, and you stop and think, just physically getting this mutilated body off the cross is, is going to be pretty gory. And let me just go ahead and say it here, and David Roper apparently mentioned this. I didn't get to look at David this week. This would be my understanding. By these two men handling a dead body on late Friday, they will be unclean and not able to take of the Passover because they've been in touch with a dead body. And even from afar, aren't we grateful that there was somebody there to at least take care of the Lord's body after he died? And, and I'm just thinking mechanically, you just stop and think, you know, getting the nails, how are we going to get him down? And it's, one person could probably do it, but you might, draw, you know, it's just, it gets difficult. And you can just see if we've got at least two guys who take this project, we're going to take it on ourselves and we're going we're gonna to get the body down and we're going to wrap it in this clean linen cloth. And then Nicodemus, of all things, is going to bring, I think it's 75 pounds of ointment and stuff initially to do that. And all this is going on. And, bless their hearts, there's two ladies over here watching all this. Now, I wouldn't have been there either, but my question is always, and where's Matthew? Where's Peter? We know John is going to be at the cross because he's given Jesus' mother. That's the only indication we have, and we'll touch on this later. Isn't it interesting, my dad uses the term, when the dust settles, who's there? Two of the most unlikely people that you could ever have imagined in, in the gospel account, and in terms of the amount of time that they've spent with Jesus, it's just a fraction compared to the 12. And bless their hearts. We're so grateful that these two guys came forward and were willing to, and there's a risk, both socially, uh, physical risk, and they are willing to become physically unclean, and there's a stipulation in the law of Moses, you can take the Passover a month later if you were unclean for whatever reason. And just incidentally, that's why you hear this term whitewashed tombs. Uh, the, just the few days before the Passover each year, this was the standard practice. They would go whitewash the tombs because if you've come from, and you fill in the blank, Bithynia, Parthia, it doesn't matter where it's from, and make this trip there, the last thing you want to do is touch a tomb and become unclean. And this expression, oh, you are whitewashed tombs, they did that every year to say, you know, don't touch this. And so these two men are physically going to take on this act of love and grace and all these other terms you want to use, and physically uh, will be unable to partake of the Passover. And I think, what a contrast. The Jewish leaders were unclean. We followed the law of Moses. And then here, Joseph and Nicodemus are willing to physically become unclean to be able to bury our Lord. We always learn something when we come back. And isn't this interesting? When it says the next day, I'm going to take this to be the Sabbath. What was one of the biggest criticisms that the religious leaders had of Jesus? He doesn't keep the Sabbath. The next day, I would assume on the Sabbath day, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. We're going to go have a business meeting. We're going to go conduct business. Um, in 2019, we were able to visit Israel for the first time, and we stayed in Tiberias. Uh, we were with Everett Hufford, who had grown up in Nazareth. And we stayed at a, at a hotel next to the, the Sea of Galilee. And we got there on Sunday, and we were going through Samaria. And, of course, Everett, having grown up there, um, the high priest of the uh, Samaritans was on the street and shaking his fist and uttering all kinds of things against us because we were traveling on the Sabbath day. And uh, <laughs> But Everett just told us, he said, now when we get here, he said, the third elevator, please do not get on today because a whole bunch of Jewish people will come to this hotel for the Sabbath day and they don't want to have to work by pushing button for floor number three so the elevator will stop at every floor on the way up 
and that way you can come down and someone else, maybe a Gentile or someone's prepared the food, so you can eat on the Sabbath day, but you can get in and off the elevator without having to work because they set the elevator to stop at every floor and the Jews would prefer for you Gentiles not to be on their elevator so they can get up and down the floor without having to work and, and push the button. And they were having a great Sabbath day. Well, here these guys are so proud of themselves because they've kept the Sabbath, they've been critical of Jesus, but we might need to make an exception if we need to have a business meeting with Pilate. And notice, sir, we remember how, and this to me is one of the key words today, this translation says, that imposter. And we'll look at the word here in just a second. And notice this, with Matthew writing to a Jewish audience, this has basically been the position of Judaism toward the deity of Jesus since the first century. Is he a Jew? Yes. Maybe born in Bethlehem? Yes. Son of God? No. He's an imposter. And so these religious leaders say that imposter said, after three days I will rise again. And on the next page, therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and say and tell the people he's risen from the dead. The last, and depending on your translation, fraud, error, delusion, deception will be worse than the first. And this always interests me in that for the apostles to have been with him all of this time, and we'll just see some samples in Matthew later, they hear this over and over again, and it, and it never registers. This whole going to die, I wonder, probably, they're so busy worried about who's going to sit on the right hand, the left hand, and who's going to be the greatest, that this idea of him dying, and even Peter will even rebuke him when he starts talking about this. But I wanted to look at six words, and these will go just really quick, but notice this. Look at the word remember. <laughs> the Jewish leaders remember teaching that Jesus has made that the apostles don't. They kept this in mind. They thought about it. They recalled. And you'll see that word remember used in different ways. And then look at the word imposter. This is 3-2 if you're coming down. Root meaning to lead astray, to be deceitful, to be a deceiver or an imposter. And so your American standard will say, instead of imposter, the deceiver. Another translation, a liar, a beguiler. <clears throat> and then another translation just says, a man who, who fooled the people. And you'll see down, you get down to Second John, even there's the coming of the Antichrist and the deceiver is going to be that, that same word that's there. The word fraud or deception, <clears throat> it originally has to do with someone who's, who gets lost. They're roaming and they're wandering and they, they get off the track. But <clears throat> it has to do, again, with error or delusion deceit or deception, uh, give an order, and I'm sorry, <laughs> every time I read this I just firstly laugh. Make the tomb as secure as you can. Okay, let's just face it. It doesn't matter where Jesus is placed on earth, what's going to happen on the third day? <laughs> he's, he's coming out. There's nothing on earth that's going to prevent the fulfillment of these prophecies, especially that our Lord has made. And I just kind of laugh at the feebleness of it. Okay, you guys do the very best you can. Get a guard, set a seal, and make the tomb as secure as you can. And you'll look at this, oh, to ensure security by preventative measures, to guard against escape. And remember even Paul and Silas, their feet are in stock so that they will be prevented, they will be secure, prevent from escaping. And <clears throat> to just make this secure against any kind of intrusion that's going to come in. And then the word seal is very interesting. <laughs> They're going to place some type of seal across the stone. And, and, and these stones are huge. 
And normally when they would, like in this case, they would cut the tomb out of the rock and then dig out an area underneath. And when they roll that stone down, that's kind of the whole issue about even putting the spices on Jesus. Who's going to roll the stone away? And so here are all these physical things that are done to make sure that our Lord remains in the tomb. I laughed when I came across Daniel 6, 17. A stone was brought and laid at the mouth of the lion's den. And the king put a seal on it with his own seal, even in Daniel chapter 6. <clears throat> this is what I love looking at words. Words are, I read a, a guy once, he said, words are like biblical atoms. Once you find a word and kind of find how it's used, it's always amazing. And I was looking at this word deceiver and seal, and guess where you have these terms used? Revelation 20. Notice the contrast. An angel sealed closed the mouth of the abyss over the dragon. <laughs> Who is Satan? The great deceiver. And where is he kept? Oh, an angel is going to seal him in the abyss. And Revelation 20, verse 2, He laid hold on the dragon, that ancient serpent, which is the devil and Satan. He bound him up for a thousand years. He cast him into the bottomless pit. He shut him up. And he set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. So the word devil has to do with slander, an adversary. Satan is also the adversary. <clears throat> and I laugh at it from this point of view. Two people specifically in scripture are called the deceiver. Jesus by the Jews, and this is the name for Satan. And I don't care what kind of seal that you place on the tomb of the first deceiver, he's coming out on the third day. Guess what's gonna to happen to the devil? There's no way. And I always just kind of look at the contrast between these because both of these are used, that term deceiver and the term seal. <clears throat> the consequences are very different. Anything that's done by man is only temporary compared to the things that are done by God. Joseph Arimathea, and no one really quite knows where Arimathea is. <clears throat> The general consensus is that it's probably in, in the area of Judea. But we do know since he has a tomb in Jerusalem, he's probably moved into the area of Jerusalem, and that's where he's living at. So on the next page, I just wanted to just highlight, here are the gospel accounts, and they will each have a little bit to say, okay, who was this person named Joseph? <coughs> Matthew 27, 57, okay? A rich man from Arimathea. He was a disciple of Jesus, and again, he had been discipled, but that, I just find that very interesting. Somewhere, somehow, within this ministry, and Jesus spends a lot of time in Jerusalem. Yes, the ministry's up at Capernaum and up in Galilee, but John will tell us at least three years and the, the Passovers and things, at some point, Jesus has contact with him. We're not told when and where. Mark tells us Joseph is a respected member of the council. He was also looking for the kingdom of God. And that's just an interesting little tidbit. Uh, he's a member of the council. He's looking for the kingdom of God. And I love this term. He took courage. He boldly went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Luke is going to tell us, yes, he's a member of the council. He is a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action. Remember, the Sanhedrin's going to get together, condemn him as being guilty, and Joseph had not participated in that. And again, he's looking for the kingdom of God. But he's also a disciple of Jesus. Secretly for fear of the Jews... He asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. So here's our first person who's going to be involved in burying our Lord. And then I love this from the, from the Gospel of John because we have this wonderful snapshot in John chapter 3 of Nicodemus, the ruler who comes to Jesus by night. 
And, and what do these two guys have in common? There's a, there's a, and we're going to see this word fear. There's a fear, retaliation, and other things of what's going to happen if the Jews uh, are aware of this. And so John tells us in 1938, Joseph of Arimathea came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had earlier come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about 75 pounds in weight. I, I literally have no idea. But I just, when I read that, I'm thinking, how much is this worth? 75 pounds of perfume? Spices type thing? Um, this is not like getting a little plastic can of McCormick's spice. This is, this is a major investment, if we use that term. They took the body of Jesus. They bound it in clean cloths with spices as the burial custom was of the Jew. The tomb was close at hand, and that's all that we know about the location. Then wherever Joseph had prepared his tomb, it's close by, and just, just physically just kind of stop and think what's gonna be involved in this. We're gonna take the body down, we're gonna wrap it up. <coughs> I'm not sure if they have the spices on the inside now. So if you're two guys, are you gonna add another 75 pounds to the body, or are you gonna take the body to the tomb and do, but just kind of think about the mechanics of what's involved. And they're gonna take the body down, wrap it. Nicodemus has brought these 75 pounds of uh, spices and things, and then they're going to bury our Lord. Think about this. Joseph did a courageous thing. Pilate's not gonna be in a good mood. This has been a bad weekend. And everybody knows the pressure that's been put on Pilate. But Joseph is going to have the courage and the nerve to go to Pilate. And think about this. This writer said, Joseph sided with a crucified criminal. And he loaned Jesus his new tomb that day. There apparently was a Jewish custom that if a criminal was buried in a tomb, it couldn't be used again by the original owner. He may have forfeited the use of the tomb for himself. We're not told that in scripture. But think about this. What would become known of the two guys who came to ask for the body of Jesus? And again, I keep asking, and, and where are the apostles right now? Jesus said, you will be scattered like sheep among the hills. They're, they're nowhere to be seen. And so these two guys are going to do something that's just totally unacceptable in many circles. And we don't know, but this comes to mind. Are they going to be allowed to retain their positions in Judaism when this is all discovered? I wonder, did they become disciples as the book of Acts unfolds and even convert to becoming Christians? What consequences did their desire to give Jesus a proper burial have on their future? <clears throat> we've already mentioned 5-3 the Jews are going to gather together technically break the Sabbath to make the request of Pilate and why would a group of Jews gather together and bother Pilate again on a Sabbath day well there's still a great fear of Jesus they feared the miracles and the signs and <clears throat> they didn't want to have the rumors that he may have been raised from the dead to be betrayed. <clears throat> I just thought quickly, and we'll just give the verse and just mention this. Look at the times that Jesus has mentioned to the apostles, either Jerusalem, death, buried, raised, a number of things are there. But Matthew 16, 21, he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Matthew 17, 23, they will kill him and on the third day he'll be raised to life. The apostles are, are full of grief. He's going up to Jerusalem in 2017. They'd be handed over to the Gentiles, be mocked, flocked, crucified. Third day, he will be raised to life. Matthew 26, 2, the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. <clears throat> and again, just listen to this, and I think, what are the number of times that the apostles have heard, and we do not know, I, I always compare this, how many times have Nicodemus and Joseph heard? 
And just the contrast is always very interesting. And the same thing is true of the Jewish leaders. They've heard Jesus say this occasionally, <clears throat> and they really are focused in on trying to prevent this from taking place. The word fear, and I'll leave you to read most of these. Isn't this interesting? For fear of the Jews is true both of Joseph and Nicodemus. <clears throat> the Gospel of John has three times where the term put out of the synagogue is used. The only one that's used in the gospel accounts, and you'll see that of <clears throat> the blind man's parents in 922, 1242 for fear of being put out of the synagogue, and then John 162, they will put you out of the synagogue. <clears throat> we don't know what happens to Joseph and Nicodemus. I wouldn't be surprised if they lose their positions in Judaism after stepping forward to do this. In the middle of this page, I just thought this was interesting. Jesus died during three hours of darkness. And the man, Nicodemus, who had come to Jesus by night, it's as if Joseph and Nicodemus both step out of the darkness into the light to claim and to ask for the body of Jesus. And Jesus had talked to Nicodemus about the true light that comes into the world. <clears throat> On the next page, this is gruesome. Bodies of crucified criminals were oftentimes just thrown into a field. And if the Romans did it, like I said, they preferred for them to stay on the cross for a long time. They actually found a, uh, a probably a well-to-do Jew who was crucified that still had the nails in his hands and his feet, found the skeleton a few years ago. And these three women are gonna be at the cross Women follow Joseph and Nicodemus to the tomb. And ladies, don't, don't get upset. But in, in first century law courts, the women's testimony didn't have the same weight that a man would. And I always read this, and I think, you wouldn't make this up unless it was true. But who are the actual witnesses that he died? Three women who are going to be those who follow and are the witnesses to where he is actually buried? Two women. Who are the first people to come to the tomb on the first day of the week? Women. And they are going to be our first primary witnesses to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. <clears throat> I'm going to drop down to 5-4, and we'll finish here in just a second. I wonder, okay, and scripture is silent. Whatever happened to Simon of Cyrene, who's coming into the city and is forced to carry the cross? Mark tells us he's the father of Rufus and Alexander, so whoever read Mark knew Rufus and Alexander. But that's why, again, I wouldn't tell your grandkids they look at me with, with a blank stare. I love to listen to Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story. And it would go on, he would tell some very interesting event or something that took place. And then he came to point, he would pause, and now he would say, What? And now you know the rest of the story. Yeah. What happened? Simon of Cyrene. The centurion at the foot of the cross. David, did he become a Christian? What happens to Joseph of Arimathea? What happens to Nicodemus? Oh, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? What happened to the Ethiopian eunuch? And see, the power of the gospel, remember Jesus talks about this seed that's planted. We never know what God's going to do in people's lives at different times in different places and should never underestimate the power of that gospel. The last part, <clears throat> we're actually going to do it at the Lord's Supper today, but I'll just give you a preview. There are two Josephs, and we're going to use the term today, bookends. There are two Josephs that are at the opening and at the closing of Matthew. And what a contrast. The first Joseph is a carpenter. He's going to have a wife and seven kids. The second Joseph is a wealthy man. 
And these two men are going to both open and close the story of Jesus. But I'll finish with this. There are two times when we're totally helpless. When we're born and when we die. And aren't we grateful in the life of our Lord that there were two Josephs who are just as different as they could be who stepped forward to care for the physical needs of our Lord in both of those circumstances.